Hey everybody, I'm Meredith Doty and this is Sweating Shirtless. Every episode, I dive deep into unpacking the fitness world through a body confident and inclusive lens while picking the brains of inspiring, brilliant, accomplished, honest, new and old friends talking about their experience with Sweating Shirtless. In this episode, I sit down with Raisa Hoffman, Director of Talent at The Handlebar, and we talk all about auditioning for becoming a spin instructor. Raisa began her journey at The Handlebar in 2014, first as bar staff, then on to becoming an instructor, and then senior instructor, then Director of Talent. When not teaching at The Handlebar, she's also an actor in the Boston area. You may have seen her as Lady Macbeth in shit-faced Shakespeare's productions pre-pandemic. She brings a party wherever she goes, and she's Sean Paul's number one fan. This is a super special episode. We are taking a deep dive into the ins and outs of auditioning and landing a coveted spin instructor spot. We talk all about what to expect from auditions, how to prepare, like what you should wear and what music you should play. And I also also ask Raisa more about the intricacies of her job as director of talent at a studio with four locations. On to the show. All right, Raisa, thank you so much for joining this special edition of Sweating Shirtless. Yay, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I know. So we're going to do a deep dive into all things spin auditioning and landing your first spin job. And who is the better person to talk to about that than the director of talent herself? Yay! <laughs> so I, before we get going on all the nitty gritty, we'll just go over your... Um, your journey to becoming a spin instructor and then go over all the basics and questions that we get all the time about auditioning and then we'll go into a little bit about your technique as director of talent which i'm so excited to get into that awesome i'm so excited to share um yeah so i'll i'll dive right in and the first question was about how i became a spin instructor yeah just your journey cool so I um, was always super into fitness and um, was always a big runner and like training for half marathons. And I always wanted to do a marathon, but never did because I actually ended up getting hurt and had to do low impact exercise for a really long time. And I found the handlebar through one of my best friends growing up um, who works the desk here in Southie in 2014. So I started working the desk and taking classes and completely fell in love with it. And, um, just the music and the energy and leading the room. And I also grew up as a performer and majored in acting in college and was acting professionally for a while. So the fusion of athleticism and teaching and coaching while also performing and being on stage was just such a beautiful marriage of everything that I've always loved. So as I was working the desk, I started to kind of have the little tickle of, do I want to be up there? Could I do this? Could I like, I think I could do this. I feel like this is a really great fit. And then once that seed was planted, I started making moves to get some experience. Um, before auditioning for Handlebar, which for me has always was always the, like the place, like that's where I want to be teaching. So I got certified through Mad Dog Athletics, and it was a, a generic spinning certification. And then got experience at a small gym in my hometown, teaching um, in a in a small room with like I think it was nine bikes, and just got some experience like feeling out my vibe and music taste. And then when the handlebar was holding auditions in 2016, I slid my name in and was like, please see me. And the rest is history. <laughs> I love that. I have a very similar story, but I didn't realize you taught somewhere prior to HP. Oh yeah. I was <laughs> playing, playing the classic Raisa, classic Raisa dirty dirt in my hometown. That's um, amazing. It was so fun. <laughs> How different do you think your class was then to now? Super different. Like I, I think music taste has always been kind of the same. Like, well, it's definitely expanded, but in terms of um, just like the genres that I gravitate mostly to, which is like hip hop, trap, like um, right. that whole reggae. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> reggaeton. 
Um, so I was definitely, it was a testing ground for me to see how my taste was landing on people. Cause that was always the first thing I noticed taking classes at the gym or wherever was like the music was make or break. And I know that that is a universal feeling when it comes to cycling. Um, the music is really like the most has the power to enhance the whole experience. So I, it was definitely a testing ground to like see how it was sticking and if people liked it and I got some good feedback and it, it was a hoot and they were so, the owners of that gym were so nice and like just letting me run with it. Um, but I was really just feeling it out, like just getting my bearings and figuring out how to count. And like, I'll never forget the first feeling when I actually counted into like a jump or something <laughs> and everybody did it. I was like, I'm teaching, <laughs> I'm doing the thing doing the thing that's yeah. something that I I know there's like a lot of different um techniques or like routes to getting into specifically studio spinning but for me those years that I spent at you know the bigger box gyms really were so fundamental and like like fundamental years for me to really just like you said just figure yourself out get your voice get comfortable like there's a lot of things that you end up working through like even just like internally that I would rather do on that smaller stage than like the bigger stage that is a studio. 100%. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. And like, I remember the, at the gym I was teaching at, we didn't have a sound system. It was um, no microphone and it was an iPod speaker and it was like Bluetooth. And I had my first experience with like, a speaker that didn't work or like having a troubleshoot in the moment. And like, it was really like gave me experience using my voice to command without the microphone. So like when I got to handlebars audition, I was like, Oh, we got this. Cause I actually had like a headset. Um, so exactly. Like it's such a good, and I always say, cause that's the, that is the biggest question that people ask is, do I need experience like to audition for the handlebar like, or any, like, do you need experience to get seen at an audition? And it's sort of that catch 22 of like, you need to be hired in order to get experience, but nobody's hiring if you're not getting experience. And th it's tricky. Cause like on the one hand, you don't need it at all to be moldable and workable and have everything that it takes but it definitely helps with confidence and sense of self and kind of working out the kinks before you get up and audition for like a boutique studio or someplace that you're really, really wanting to teach. Completely agree. Like it's almost like when you first get to becoming a, a spin instructor, you think it's like really glitzy, glammy and like amazing, which it is. And there's so much like, there's so many amazing benefits and beautiful things of being an instructor, but at the same time, like you're very much on a stage and people are very much looking for you to be a leader. And if you aren't fully assured in who you are, um, you know, being, people critique you all the time with whether they have like any idea what they're talking about or not. And it can really affect you if you're not solid in, in, in your product. So yeah, I completely agree. But it's not necessary. It's not necessary. It's it's almost more like I would prefer it for myself. But it's not. It's not a need. It's it's a nice to have. Definitely. One hundred percent. Totally. So from twenty fourteen, you were you started at Bar Staff, and then in twenty sixteen, you auditioned. Aside from finding the a studio um, gym at your home to teach at, was there any other tips and tricks that you picked up? along the way as like being an insider at the studio? Hmm, that's such a great question. And I never, I've never thought about this. Um, tips and tricks. I wanna say that, I mean, I knew the studio and I knew the community and I knew the product and I knew the vibe so well in and out. Like I had been studying instructors classes, studying what choreo they use, studying their transitions for a long time before I got up to audition. So like the passion for the studio was really taught me, I feel like everything I needed to know to succeed. So like on one side of the coin, it was getting 
the experience and confidence in myself, but on the other side of it was knowing like, this is the handlebar and this is their, vo like this is the, it's tricky because it's like when you are casting the net at a bunch of different studios and you really just want a teaching job, like that's one way to go about it. But the, the biggest thing that contributed to my, I think getting hired to teach was how well I knew the intricacies of the product just from, be, from riding so much um, and being passionate about the community. I mean, at least at the handlebar, that's like the biggest thing is like, are you, a, are you a member of this community? Do you want to be a member of this community or are you just looking for it like a job? So um, I think that was really helpful. And I don't know that I would have found the same passion to teach anywhere other than the handlebar. I think specifically like because of falling for the community and the product so much. Um, but yeah, it's like, I remember um, I would take people's, it was actually Eve's class. I would take Eve's class and then I would like memorize stuff she was doing and then I would go like practice it at the gym. <laughs> and like, that's really how, how you find yourself. It's like being inspired by someone and trying it out, trying it out on yourself and then finding yourself without copying, if that makes sense. Well, totally. It's, I think it's like the two things. It's like one, like you are an, you're an ambassador for the studio and the studio wants people who are like, like almost like passion for the studio is, will is weighted heavier, weighted more than like your experience and like your ability to teach. Like we can teach you how to teach, but we can't make you passionate. Right. That's 100% true. And it is, you can be a phenomenal instructor that would probably be super successful. Sorry, my computer notifications are on in the background. Um, you can be a phenomenal instructor, but that passion and that drive to be a member of the community is, is really like, it's the biggest thing that I look for and feel out in an audition process for sure. Yeah, and it's hard to fake. Oh yeah, we can sniff it out. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's go into the actual audition process because I'm assuming yours was a little bit different than mine for the HP. So let's go over the two different types oh, or cool. how they differ. Yeah, so they actually were pretty similar. So I did, I went through a ride test. The same, so the ride test is um, a piece of our audition where we just gauge people's endurance and, you know, hitting the beat, ability to nail choreo, um, energy on the bike. And I did that and I re vividly remember, this was a time when the quicker paces were not as much of a thing as they were in 2018. Was that when you auditioned? 2018, yeah. So I could barely like jog. I like, remember just hauling it during this ride test. Like I thought I was gonna faint and I think I might have. Like I went into the hallway and like my lungs were like burning and my leg, and, the, and I know it makes it sound like totally like out of control, but it was just the fact that I wasn't in shape. Like I wasn't ready for that kind of endurance. <laughs> like, but it, sorry, I'm going on a million different tangents, but we de we had a ride test and I was like my life depends on it like they everyone was walking around with clipboards and, yes. and I was like you cannot mess this up Raisa and then there was an elimination round and a callback and I got to the callbacks and then there was a callback after the callback so it was pretty similar to how how I run them now um, and. Yeah, I do remember vividly that during the second callback, so this was like the final, like there's 10 of us and we're gonna nar narrow it down to like four or three. And I remember I was on there doing my thing and I like flipped my hair to try and be cool. And my ponytail got completely stuck in my headset. I actually have a headset here, so I'll show you. I... <laughs> So my headset was on and my ponytail got stuck like 
in the mouthpiece. <laughs> I literally just kept going and I was, I was dying laughing and Candace was in the room and Candace was in the back just laughing with her face in her hand. And I, I just kept going and I was like laughing and like having fun with it and like making jokes about cousin it and like <laughs> just, I, and I think that that's actually what got me through surprisingly, like that authenticity and that going with the flow, not taking it too seriously, not trying to be something you're not, not trying to like be a cool, awesome robotic fitness instructor, just being yourself and like, engaging with what's happening in a genuine and authentic way. Um, and that is like, ex we don't look for people to mess up, but how people handle a mess up is super informative in the whole process. Yes, like the obstacle, like the random obstacles are massive opportunities for you to really shine. Yep, it's just when things go wrong, it is material. For you to capitalize on if things are going perfectly it's way harder to be authentic because you're just so focused on nailing everything that you're not giving any room for spontaneity or for your personality to really shine yeah i would say like going into your know, auditioning going into an audition like you really don't think of it as aside from the ride test it's like ride or die like you need to get through this but once yeah. you're past the ride test and you're on to the like more personality side where you have an opportunity to play music and, and teach a little, like um, you want to go into it like just to be yourself and have fun with it. And, and like how many times have you seen people audition multiple times and like that and their commitment and their time to show up time and time again and get better and progress is what gets them in at the end of the day. Mm hmm exactly like that is that dedication and the being genuinely excited about the feedback you're getting and curious and approaching it with like curiosity and um welcoming of feedback and is just automatically going to skyrocket somebody to succeed like so much quicker than someone who's thinking, oh shoot, this means I'm doing this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. It's like feedback and getting that criticism and even being told no is just really an opportunity to, to grow. Definitely. Let's go into like the fun things of auditioning. Like what should people wear? Ooh. Um, <laughs> what did you wear? <laughs> the, I know what people shouldn't wear, which is brands of studios that are not the one you're auditioning for. <laughs> Does that happen? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, and that's fine. Like, I get it. People have what they have, but it definitely isn't an awesome look when you're trying to be a canvas to be, like you said, an ambassador. And you're like, but I'm also an ambassador for this other place. <laughs> um which doesn't mean like you can't go somewhere else. Like we all go everywhere because we love it. At the end of the day, it's fitness. We love it. Um, but truly like, what are you going to be comfortable and confident in? That is like the biggest thing. Like if you want to wear a t-shirt with your favorite band on it, do it. If you want to wear a sports bra, do it. If you want to wear shorts, go for it. Um, whatever says I'm, the thing that's coming to my mind right now is Meredith Martin when she auditioned in like a full pink, um, pink pizza like suit. And <laughs> she was like, my three favorite things are pizza, pink and smiles or sparkles. It was one of those three things. And I remember being like, there's no way this girl is serious. And she was serious. Like that is Meredith Martin's personality <laughs> like to a T. Like, so that kind of, this is me, this is who I am, is always welcome. Yeah, and and not only welcome, like encouraged and like wanted. Right. You know? we, don't exactly. need, we don't need carbon, at least that handlebar, we value individuality. Like we don't want carbon copy instructors. We want people to be themselves. Like that's the authenticity of what is the magic sauce. Exactly. 
yeah, I remember, I think I wore a, it was like a spaghetti strap halter and it said chase the beat on it. But I like tied it in the back. I don't, I forget why. I turned it into like a belly shirt. <laughs> and I was like, this is so cool. And I wore a matching sweatband. I kid you not, a sweatband that had the same print as my leggings. And I think it was from Lulu. Um, yeah, I was like all about the matching. Matching sweatband with the leggings was my vibe. <laughs> Love that. I think I wore to the ride. I know what I wore to the ride test more than the other things. Like the ride test, I wore this like camo bra that I bought at Lulu that day. This was like before my Lulu obsession. So this was like a big deal that I bought it. And then um, like black leggings, but I like had put a fresh layer of spray tan on and I like smelled like spray tan and like full makeup. Cause I knew you were taking photos too for the ride test. You took a photo of us all. I'm like, I, oh, yeah. this photo. <laughs> I keep finding your entire audition groups, like little Polaroids, like all around my apartment. Like they're just, I don't know what I, I must've like come home and just put them in a drawer because I keep finding them. I'm like, whoa, how's this girl doing? She's like, <laughs> they're just all over the place but the, yeah the polaroid is um so helpful for us to like keep putting faces to names and remembering because it when there's a lot of people and there usually is a lot of people um it's super helpful yeah and then for my one of the callbacks oh i think we only we had like ride tests and then people were cut that night and then we had like the second round and then the third round was like the final Oh uh, yeah. And um I had my hair down. I had it short then and I had it all like wavy how I did. And I rode I never ride or teach with my hair down, but for the audition I had it down and like it was part of my like choreo of like flipping. <laughs> I remember that was that callback was when I had neurovirus. Remember? No. And I was in the bathroom and I like I had been oh, like yeah. Yeah, and I was like, I got hit with it like during my double that I was teaching. And I taught my whole second class like about two. <laughs> and then I went to the callback and and was in the bathroom for like all of it. And during, and I could hear people's sets during through the wall. And I was like, who is that? They sound awesome. Like tell them <laughs> to hold on, I'll be right out. <laughs> And then I think they made you do it for me because it was so great and they wanted me to see it. So they like, they were like, let's go again. Just do everything you already did. Do it again. Yeah, I was shook because usually when you had people do it again, like you, everyone was like, oh, it's, it's not one way or the other. But I'm like, if, if I'm asked to do it again, it means I screwed something up. Like, but it was just because you wanted to see me hair flip again. <laughs> I was like, she looks great. <laughs> um, um, all right. So clothing, you know, just wear what you wear. Feel, feel comfortable. Um, maybe like, yeah, just be comfortable and, and, and be your most authentic self. Um, now on to music. Ooh. So music choice or like, like kind of like what we look for when people are doing their sets? Um, let's go choice and then what you look for. Cool, so music choice is like, I think the most exciting part of the whole process um, because it is such a quick way to like see who somebody is, like what gets them going, what type of vibe do they want in their class, like, it goes beyond just favorite artist. It's, I always say that to some degree, when you're playlisting for your class or playlisting for an audition, you're saying like, this is me as a performer. Like if I were about to do a concert, like, or I'm a DJ or I am Beyonce, like this is me, like this is my persona. It goes beyond just liking the song. It's like, what is, what energy do I want to share with the room that feels authentic to me and gets me going? Because if, if it's getting me going, it's going to get the whole room going. And that's the best instructors are the ones that could that can get the entire room on the same page as them with regard to 
what they're feeling during a specific song. So like an instructor could come in and literally play a violin string quartet and have us ride to it, which typically might not be somebody's choice to spin to. But if that instructor is in it and selling it and passionate about it, it's going to translate. And that's what makes a diverse and beautiful instructor and instructor team is welcoming all of those different music tastes. Um, and I remember, what did I, oh, I auditioned with um, the Red Lips Arrow Chord remix, which was sick. Reminder, I'm going to play that this week. Um, and then Like This by Mims, OG, no remix. <laughs> like This like this you know that song oh my gosh that that was now that you're singing it i'm like remembering it (laughs) um and it was because i like wanted to show kind of a more ethereal trappy moody side and i wanted to show like my love of like 2000s hip-hop um so the biggest thing i would say is it has to be music you love like love 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 because it will translate if you're just kind of like blah about it hi griffin is he crying he's crying right there griffy come here come. <laughs> he's like i'm hungry mom come. Griffin. so um, music that yeah music that you um oh my god he's so cute hello <laughs> music that gets you, that you are so into, and then it'll translate. And then if you have an opportunity to play anywhere from one song to three songs, if you have two or three songs you're playing, um, um, like a multitude of vibes and genres, like a really, if you're gonna play three songs, they all should speak to a different side of your m- music taste and also energies that you want to bring to the room as a cycling instructor so like for example if you love like if i had three songs and i was auditioning i would do something like moody and ethereal and trappy and then something like hip-hop um maybe unremixed maybe 2000s and then something in the more like um mumba reggaeton genre which i feel like are the three vibes that I play with a lot in class, um, whereas someone might have more pop music or EDM. It's just really what gets you going. Yeah. Totally. What gets you going, Griff? <laughs> Griff likes snacks and going for walks. Is, it's what gets him going. <laughs> um, and then I played Buku front to back. I think that's how you pronounce it. B-U-K-U, front to oh, back. Oh, yeah. And then I played Muse. It was like a 180 of vibes. Oh, like yeah. Like Muse, um, I forget what song. But like, oh, yeah, yeah one, total 180. But what really sold everyone was the the front to back with the hair flip. I feel like I could have done anything with the second song and it would, would have been fine. Yeah, yeah it was but. definitely like, I remember your... It was like a confidence, like you, you weren't even necessarily saying anything. Like it was just like your whole vibe was very strong and confident and like, like your energy was, I belong up here. And, and that was it. And that's that confidence. A question mark is always so like, if, if an instructor is doubting themselves or somebody, an audition candidate is doubting themselves, that question mark is like so palpable in the room. And it's really hard to navigate that as somebody seeking instructors, like the confidence in the like, I belong here, period, not do you like me? You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Um, and one other note on, on music is make sure it like hits quickly. You know, it doesn't take a long time to get to the point because oftentimes you're not gonna play the whole song during the audition. It's like the first 30 seconds. Right, like we we know within 10 seconds whether it's a yay or a nay. There is very rarely a time where we're like, but wait, but wait, that energy is either there or it's not. And sometimes we'll give people a chance to get to like the good part of the song if we can tell it's gonna drop or 
sometimes we'll let people keep going if we're really, really loving it. Um, but it, another note is that like, if we say next within 15 seconds, it doesn't mean that it was bad. We could be like, great, awesome. Let's see the next one. Or we could be saying, okay, let, this isn't working. Let's go to the next one. So there's really like, there's so much pent up nerves around what we do in the audition room, whether we tell them to keep going or stop or do it again. Um, and none of it, there is no constant variable to that. Like it's, it changes person to person for a million reasons. Um, so reading into that is just a dead end always. Yeah. What about, what are your thoughts on doing choreography? I think it is so not necessary unless we're in phase million of a callback round and we're doing like multiple rounds of callbacks. It's so not necessary. Like it is energy. Can you ride the bike? Can you hit the beat? Do you command the space? Do, do you have a presence? Am I drawn in? Does it feel authentic? It choreo is great, but there is nothing that I personally hate more than when the entire time that an instructor is auditioning, I can feel them tracking the next piece of choreo and leaning on choreo as a crutch rather than just living in the moment, doing their thing. Um, I'll never forget like Jared Meyer's audition. He literally just got on the bike and just started riding and was just like whipping towels and like saying random stuff. and. It, definitely clear that there was no teaching experience there, but so much energy, confidence. And at that point, all you have to do is sprinkle in the technique. Um, so it's way better to show, like we can teach choreo, we can teach counting, we can teach cueing, but you can't teach confidence, presence, personality, command, all of that. You can, you can teach those things, but it's, it's not gonna, in an audition where you're looking for people who are malleable and can grow and who are unique, that's what's really going to stand out more. Yeah. And especially in, it's so competitive these days. Like if so there's so many spinning studios and there's so many people that love spinning and want to take it to that next level that, um, you know, it is competitive. So say, you know, someone auditions and um, they're curious about like, the job aspect of it what what do you think is um a good estimate in terms of being a very general in like a large city like boston in terms of salary what can people expect um for for full-time fitness so let's talk about we'll talk about full-time after but if someone has a nine to five and wants to be part-time like me part-time um, so it really, de it really depends. Um, it depends how much you want to teach. It depends how many, how many classes you're teaching, how well your classes are doing. Um, and I think it really, really varies studio to studio. I know that for, in my experience, like before I was full time at the handlebar, I, was using teaching as a supplemental income to my performing on the side. And I was like also catering and acting and then also teaching. So it was, it was definitely not at that point in time, something I was, my whole income was not from that. Um, but it was definitely a really wonderful supplement to having like multiple interests and multiple passions. Um, I truly cannot remember what the actual amount like is, but it's definitely a great supplemental income, um, unless you're somebody who wants to be full-time fitness. From here, um, so say someone came to you and they're super green, they don't have any, they're not like really they're not working at any studios yet, but they want to be full-time boutique fitness. What would your biggest piece of advice be to them? Um, my biggest piece of advice to someone who wants to be full-time fitness is 
you really, really have to be scrappy. You have to be willing to be there, to do it, to sacrifice a lot of the kind of, um, almost like conventions of work that you get from a more steady schedule, like a nine to five, because the meat in full-time fitness is the weekends. It's the early mornings, it's the late nights, it's the holidays, that's the meat of high traffic time slots. You also kind of have to be willing to build less popular time slots, like a noon um, and 8 a.m., which are so rewarding if you stick them out and create your following. Um, one piece of advice that I have for all new instructors who are building is every single time you teach a class, if you convince one person to come back next week, it's gonna take 30 weeks, which is a lot of weeks, but 30 weeks, and that's only if you're getting one person to fill 30 bikes in that noon. And if you compartmentalize it that way and just really work on building, like you don't necessarily have to have the 6 a.m. You can have the noon and that's your noon. Like really take ownership of your time slots, exposure, sub as much as possible, and also be really open to continued education and growing and continuing to get certifications in different mediums of fitness. Um, try other types of um, exercise classes that complement cycling and see if it's a good fit. And also be really in tune with what you love about teaching cycling and how, what other types of classes tap into that as well. Like I know for me, when I was right before I went full time at Handlebar, I was in the process of getting my sculpt certification at Core Power, and I went through the whole process and I didn't end up auditioning because I ended up full time here and I put all my focus um, at Handlebar. But what I loved about sculpts was that it was also music music and beat driven and playlist driven and it was cho like choreographed that way because that's what I love about the handlebar. So like I couldn't necessarily see myself teaching something not beat based and more like strength and coaching, but for someone else, they could really be wanting to explore that. So really understanding what excites you about teaching fitness and finding the studios and the mediums that tap into that. Um, yeah, and yeah, definitely I'm going in circles, but the, the biggest thing is to be willing to kind of like sacrifice a morning on a weekend and really hustle those time slots and kind of be willing to just go wherever is needed. That's really great advice. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> so I wanted to pivot and talk a little bit more about being a director of talent and how after the audition process you have a group of however many new trainees what's your what's your approach to like step one like how do you get everyone on the same page and and yeah. moving towards the common goal yeah so it is really interesting because every single time i start a training program i'm like this is the time that i'm going to standardize it i'm finally going to standardize the training program and it never ever happens because if i believe if you're doing it right it's going to be different for every single person every single person is going to have different homework you might be covering the same things in content sessions and you might loosely have the same homework assignment but not everyone's going to be ready to move on week to week. Some people might need to come back, redo. Some people might need to focus on an entirely different like assignment altogether. What I love is um, obviously aside from just getting everybody's availability and figuring out when we're gonna meet, it's the first couple of sessions where people are on the mic that I start to get a sense of what people's areas of focus are and what people kind of are already nailing. And then from there, the group of trainees kind of just starts to blend together into groups like this person, th these three or four have teaching experience. So they're going to be focusing on authenticity, instructor persona, performance. Then you'll have people who have no experience, but are just all persona, all um, personality and they need to focus on the counting more. 
And then that's when we'll kind of break apart. And sometimes that'll mean doing sessions separately, but most of the time they just have different assignments because everyone's ultimately learning from each other. Um, so yeah, it really, it really is different every time, but I think setting the standard that everyone's there to learn from each other. And even if you feel like you're nailing something, you're still going to learn from whoever's going up on stage regardless. Um, yeah. Totally. Um, going into, so being the director of now four studios, we have North End, South East, Fenway, yeah. Um, how do you kind of standardize the product? So we have all these instructors, everyone's, and if this is like going to into HP secrets, we don't have to answer, but What's your take on having a standard product that feels similar across all of these studios, but also honing in on each instructor's authenticity? Yeah, that's such a great question. And um, it is like, it's such a tricky balance that, that I think about every day is the balance between giving instructors free reign to be themselves and also having enough consistency that people are walking in and getting a handlebar class. Um, the biggest thing is just like our terrain scale, which anybody who takes our class hears, it's the, the five through 10 terrain scale. As long as those numbers are being used, our riders are understanding what that means. And then also being on the beat, having a lead leg, doesn't matter which one, as long as it's being established, which one it is. Um, and the, having each instructor genuinely feel different from the last is what I think makes a handlebar class. And it's interesting. It's like we're standardizing the product by letting instructors really be who they are and, um, you know, play the music that they want to play, obviously with certain guidelines that, you know, and like standards as a business that we're upholding, but um, re not really not like putting too many constraints on the instructor minus the actual like being to the beat and having a terrain scale. It's really fulfilling as an instructor to be at a studio that's like that because um, it just, I mean, it's just is like some, when you're a place that at a place that really values you for you, it's such a game changer and you, it, it kind of removes that like competitive side of things. It really makes it more about community over competition because all of our differences are, are really truly valued. So I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, no, it's definitely my favorite part. It makes it exciting to know that everyone is, is we're not trying to crank out a bunch of fitness instructors who are teaching the same class. We're trying to have a consistent enough product that lets each instructor be themselves. And if we're letting each instructor be themselves and speak to their own community of people, like that's just all the more, all the more riders who are going to feel connected. I love it. I think that's a beautiful place to end. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining. This was great. And I think it's going to be so valuable for, I know that um, now that the pandemic is coming almost like a light at the end of the tunnel, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities in the fitness space. So hopefully this is helpful to anyone who's listening. Um, and I really value and appreciate your time, Ray. So thank you. Oh my gosh, of course. Thank you so much. That was so fun. And um, I hope it was helpful to anybody who's thinking about auditioning anywhere or at the handlebar or teaching in general. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Great. And on the show notes, I'll put the link to your Instagram handle. So if anyone's interested, they can follow you. Um, they know how to find both, both of us. We're not hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great night. Bye. You too.